Bonjour, good afternoon, and welcome. Uh, the Jacques Delors Institute is proud to host this uh, webinar, which is part of a Horizon Europe research project called Rebuilding Governance and Resilience Out of the Pandemic, so coined Regroup. And the, our institute is part of a, of a larger consortium uh, to lead this research, with, along with our European partners. And firstly, I will name uh, the University of Groningen uh, with uh, Professor Thierry Tortola, uh, the scientific coordinator of this uh, project that started uh, last year, last, last fall. Uh, we do this, we carry this project along with the European University Institute in Florence, the Luis uh, and uh, II in Rome, the CEDOB in uh, Barcelona, EPC in uh, you move, you me, yeah? the University of Cyprus, the Gelunian University in Cracovia, the University of Innsbruck, University of Passau, the Institute of European Integration in Hamburg, and the University of Oslo. It, I think it is important to name you all uh, to put forward the genuine uh, European dimension of this research, I think, which makes it quite uh, unique. We were glad to already host you physically here in Paris uh, last March, um, 23rd and 24th of March, with my colleagues, uh, Olalia Rubio and Andreas Eisel, who are dedicated to this project and that I thank very warmly for this. Thinking Europe is uh, our motto here at the, the Jacques Delors Institute, but thinking the governance of Europe, of the European Union, is probably one of uh, Delors' uh, favorite issue, <laughs> but a very challenging one in normal times, and even more tricky in times of crisis. But perhaps the crisis mode has become the new normal, and I think the title of this webinar recalls, recalls uh, the Eurozone crisis, the COVID pandemic, uh, the ongoing war in Ukraine, you could also uh, name the, the migration crisis, Brexit crisis, so it's almost as if it was crisis as usual. But that's what makes the topic relevant, because we need to equip European Union governance accordingly. And I think for at least uh, four reasons. The first one is there's a problem, and I had already mentioned this uh, when we uh, had this seminar in, in March about the problem of, of foresight. How to predict the unpredictable, such as the, the, when the pandemic started, we didn't see it come. When the war broke out, we, we didn't see it come. Think the unthinkable at the war. Uh, perhaps a new migration crisis uh, is perhaps looming. Perhaps a new financial crisis is looming. Perhaps a housing crisis is looming. But how do you, how can we approve, improve uh, our foresight in, in thinking, in seeing what's coming? The second problem is the problem of urgency. Uh, how to react quickly swiftly uh, avoid situations as if after the first weeks of COVID where everyone was in, in panic mode rather than in crisis management. Uh, events are, these events we're talking about, events that really need quick, swift and, and sudden moves. And there's been some improvement over the years. If uh, uh, I remember when I was a journalist covering the debt crisis, uh, the Eurozone in uh, back uh, in 2010, 11, and what we've seen now with the, the reaction to the COVID with the next generation EU, there's been some improvement, but uh, in the in the the, the this uh, uh, urgency in, in reaction. But this leads to another problem, which is the problem of competence. Uh, these crises uh, often engage uh, European action in new areas, uh, such as health, for instance, for the the vaccine, the procurement of vaccines, or uh, more recently the joint purchase of gas or weapons, all of these are completely new uh, competence for uh, for the EU or the, the issuing the debt for the EU was something also quite new, or at least to that extent. Because it's also a problem not only because it engages in new areas of competence, but also uh, even with the existing rules that become irrelevant or that are not applicable in a, anymore. Uh, remember how the Stability Pact had to be suspended or how the single market faced uh, bottlenecks. Um, and even during the, the migration crisis, I think asylum had never been thought at this scale. So even the existing rules uh, are, are not applicable. And this uh, reminds me of one of the reflections of, uh, 
Luc van Midler, who I don't need to introduce here, was uh, uh, on the fact that how we govern by the rules and how then we try to improvise uh, through events and, uh, and how we, we make this uh, come to this problem of competence. But this leads to my fourth <laughs> problem, and I will leave the problems to you. I'm not here to, to, to find solutions, but at least to, to name them. The problem of legitimacy. Uh, what kind of executive power, what kind of executive power is necessary for EU institutions to handle such crises? I think this is really the core of your reflection to combine efficiency with the, the legitimacy to act. And I think this will be very important for the, the future commission. It's a commission that will actually have much, many new tools that the previous one didn't have because they have built these new tools to, to, to face crisis. And how will they be able to trigger them? But uh, after naming those four problems I identify, uh, what makes it all more complicated is that on top of this, we have enlargement. We have a growing Europe of the EU moving from 27 to perhaps 35. And that makes these four problems even more challenging, but also even more necessary to resolve. And that's what perhaps inspired uh, French President Macron in his speech in Bratislava in, in Globsec last week. When he said, I quote, yes, the EU should be enlarged. Yes, it should be rethought very extensively with regards to its governance and its aims. Yes, it should innovate and doubtly to invent several formats and clarify each of their aims. And I think this quote needs some clarification. Um, and this project can help in perhaps in inventing these formats, formats that are often linked to a particular policy or common good, uh, for instance, the, the Eurozone or the Schengen zone. But we could perhaps imagine crisis formats when rules change or executive power shifts temporarily uh, because of, of a particular crisis. And that's also an ongoing discussion, I believe, in an expert group that our think tank is part of, along with the, uh, an expert from the Jacques Delors Center in Berlin, uh, a Franco-German group uh, who is there to have been uh, put, uh, gathered by the governments of the, of the two countries and who is preparing uh, an already much awaited report in, in September. Uh, but uh, we need political theory to solve uh, these governance issues, but we also need to draw from experience. And I think that's why we are very fortunate to have, uh, to open this seminar, this webinar, um, our president, Enrico Letta, who is here not, I think, not only as president of the Jacques Delors Institute, but as former prime minister who had to, do, had to deal with the uh, crisis uh, directly. Uh, that crisis, uh, migration crisis. Uh, Enrico, we are very fortunate to have you because uh, your experience as the European Council, uh, as a uh, member of the European Council and uh, former head of government of Italy, of a country as big as Italy, Italy has often unfortunately been uh, at the forefront of the crisis I recalled. And so uh, sharing with us your first-hand experience in, in, in this issue of governance uh, that you had to face when uh, you were in power, I think would be very important uh, for us. So I leave it to you uh, and I could to, for, uh, thank you again for accepting being the keynote speaker of this webinar and uh, uh, so you, we open the floor to you, and then uh, Alaya will moderate the, the upcoming panel. Thank you very much, and uh, I hope we have a fruitful discussion. Uh, thank you so much, Sebastian. Uh, thank you, uh, Eulalia, for uh, organizing this event and for uh, running the cooperation among uh, all these institutions that are uh, very interesting institutions uh, with a, a very broad uh, horizon of, of work together and uh, and uh, many thanks to, to Federico, Brigitte uh, and Lena because I will be more than happy to to share with all of you uh, some ideas and to listen of course uh, reactions and, and, and your thoughts about uh, a very large topic uh, but that is in my view the most interesting part of the discussion today so I'll try to be very free in the way in which I put uh, on the table some, some ideas. Uh, first of all, I will divide it in two, my very short uh, presentation. One part 
uh, the problems and the other part, the solutions. So the problem, uh, first of all, problems. When I uh, mean problems on this topic, I uh, immediately uh, have in mind, first problem is the fact that there's a big, big separation, I think a, a big gap between uh, the European level and the national level. Uh, I have to say that the formula uh, and the brand is, is very good. I heard this brand and I use it, uh, Brussels and European level as policies without politics and national level politics without policies. And I think it's, uh, in my view, it's a good brand uh, to show what is happening and what are the problems today. And the fact that if we talk uh, and if we try to uh, find solutions on how to um, uh, have a better governance at European level, uh, the, the, the first uh, topic that I have in mind is the fact that having policies without politics um, means having not a perfect and uh, a very effective governance, uh, because we are very good at European level in finding the right policies, in having in mind the directions, the long-term directions. It's not by chance that today is Brussels always leading the discussion and uh, proposing to national uh, governments, parliaments, uh, the framework, the correct framework of the discussions and framing the future too. But it is not enough uh, if you don't have politics at European level and only policies uh, risks to, uh, I say, to, to create this, this big risk of technoc technocracy that is still one of the main problems at, at European level in the uh, feeling of with the people in the relationship with the voters and with the main part of the society. So this is, in my view, the, the first uh, main uh, topic, the first main problem we have. Of course, when I um, frame like this, uh, our our discussion, I have to say also there's the other part of the problem at national level, everywhere I see uh, too much politics and too less uh, policies at national level. And the political debate is dominated by uh, political uh, discussions that are uh, unfortunately not very much linked to, uh, to policies at national level. So this is my first, uh, I, I try to identify a first problem. Uh, Sebastien uh, touched uh, the point about uh, transparency, uh, democracy, the European democracy, the lack of transparency, uh, the, the, the democratic legitimacy. Um, this is the second main chapter of our discussion and it is still there. I would like just to, uh, try to to imagine what would be next year um, the comparison between uh, among the three main uh, elections main, main democratic elections we will have next year uh, european elections uh, the us election the us presidential elections and the uk elections uh, we will have in uh, in the three main uh, say pillars of democracy liberal democracy in the world, it will be an electoral year. And I have to say that probably uh, at the end of the electoral day, uh, we are going to know who will be the next president of the US. In the same day, probably uh, we are going to know who will be the next, uh, the next prime minister of uh, the UK. Uh, it is not for granted that we know we will know something uh, about the result of the European elections. Uh, the discussion is uh, is today so under the radars, uh, and I see the, the big risk to have uh, at the end of the electoral day or the electoral four days. Uh, that is the usual way in which we vote at the European uh, Parliament. Uh, until now, the dates are 6 until the 9th of June next year. We risk to have uh, as unique 
uh, results uh, to be discussed, uh, the turnout. Uh, because if we don't have a clear commitment on how to use the vote uh, to have an influence to the designation of the president of the commission, uh, the only really interesting uh, number will be the turnout. Uh, I, I have to say that uh, before 14, 14 is the election uh, in which uh, the Spitzenkandidaten system uh, uh, immediately, immediately uh, gave us the feeling that uh, uh, the Spitzen candidate and, uh, of the EPP uh, was the, the, the potential president of the commission, so Juncker. Uh, but before 14, uh, all the discussions about the European elections uh, results were discussions based on just on, uh, on, on a national uh, base. Uh, saying that, okay, in France is more left or right, in Spain more left or right, but uh, everything based on a national discourse without any possibility to give a European uh, uh, flavor of what voters uh, did uh, during the election. And I have to say that this problem is still on the table and I, this is why I put this topic on the part of problems. Uh, on the same side, problems, I have to add another uh, crucial topic, that is the, the veto right. Veto right, as we know very well, is, is one of the main uh, problems we have. Veto right means the fact that in, uh, in the last years, uh, the culture of veto within the European Union became more and more relevant and influent. Uh, and uh, this is one of the main problems, in my view, of this governance uh, discussion. And I will try to say a few words on that. Uh, so uh, if we try to summarize what I said until now, I have to say that there's a problem of uh, politics and policies, the veto right culture, uh, the democratic legitimacy. There are two main other uh, adjectives that we use and uh, terms that you, we use close to the word democracy. Uh, the democratic fatigue in uh, many uh, countries uh, and the democratic backsliding in other countries within the European Union, uh, Hungary first, of course. Uh, democratic fatigue and democratic backsliding are two different aspects. I think it is important not to overlap uh, because there are two different uh, aspects on that, but it is part of the problem of the governance. But if I have to say at the end of this first part, the big problem of the governance is that we are able to take decisions only when we are on the edge of the cliff. At the end of the day, this is, in my view, the uh, crucial topic. And had uh, the discussion and this kind of discussion, uh, both uh, in during the COVID crisis and uh, in the um, uh, post-Russian invasion, uh, post uh, uh, February 24th, 22. Uh, as the main uh, uh, way in which uh, the European uh, institutions were able to take decisions. I think we took in the last three years uh, historic decisions uh, at a very relevant level in terms of dimension, intensity, and uh, uh, unexpected in terms of so in how revolutionary were uh, this kind of decision. Of course, next generation EU is the first example. I always use the, the example of the fact that uh, Merkel, some weeks, months before the starting of the pandemia, said that uh, uh, Euro debt, uh, it's uh, maybe a good thing for Europe, but it will be for the next generations, not for now. And uh, uh, some uh, months later, in May, uh, Merkel herself with Macron proposed 
the embryon of what uh, then we decided as next generation EU. So Euro debt, Euro investment, common debt, common investments. I don't know if they the name next generation uh, EU uh, was linked to the to what Merkel said, uh, saying that it would be for the next generation. But I think her approach was to say that uh, it is not for now, uh, and it was for now. And we are in the very at the very core of this discussion on euro debt and uh, uh, euro uh, the governance of this uh, euro budget that is the next generation um, uh, EU. And of course, the same for defense. I think we reached on defense in the last sixteen months more result more important results than the results uh, the European Union or before the European community achieved in the previous 50 years. Uh, everything in the last uh, 16, 17 months, uh, even the, the first four days of the invasion, the European Union uh, leaders were able to take decisions that were unexpected, uh, in my view, in terms of intensity and how revolutionary on a topic, defense, that was always very marginal in the European uh, Union history. So where we are, when we are on the edge of the cliff, uh, there's uh, the possibility and the ability to take decisions. Uh, very, very uh, intense and, and relevant decisions. But the same um, capacity is not when uh, there's not this pressure of urgency or this pressure of, of the cliff. And I think this is the main problem uh, of the discussion that we are having today. So I move to the second part. Uh, I'll try to share with you five topics uh, using five words. First word is democracy. Second word is veto. Third word is Brussels, fourth word is society, and fifth word is citizens. So I start with uh, democracy by saying that I, of course, I said something before to frame the topic. And now I have to say in terms of solutions, in terms of solutions, we have to, in my view, in the next months, we have to push uh, European leaders, European public opinion, European parties to be very clear in having in mind the big risk that I mentioned before. Having elections next, next year in the US in which is very clear uh, who are the uh, competitors and uh, uh, you vote for one or for the other and you know who will win and who will be the president the night of the elections. Uh, the UK will be probably the same, uh, with even with a uh, completely different uh, electoral system. In the European Union, the big risk and the, I would say, the slow discussion we are having today around uh, the Spitzenkandidaten system or the potential uh, changes in the Spitzenkandidaten system, but the application of something similar uh, it's a big risk, the fact that we don't have the discussion. Uh, I think uh, we need to have the discussion. Uh, and I tell you immediately what I think and what I would like to have. We'd like to have a system in which we will launch the Spitzenkandidat and procedure with some important conditions and some important changes. First change a system of primaries within European parties to have a decision that is not uh, clo uh, uh, closed door decisions uh, to, to have candidates, candidates uh, for, uh, for the Spitzenkandidat and system, but to have a system of primaries to choose uh, uh, within the parties, uh, the uh, candidates. Um, a legislative agreement uh, between the commission and uh, the parliament uh, and the European Council, uh, I think governments and national parliament, European Council, the European Parliament have to uh, find a compromise uh, to create a framework, a roadmap 
uh, to be able to apply the famous Article 17.7 of the Lisbon Treaty with this a little bit ambiguous uh, statement uh, uh, taking into account the result of the elections, appointing the president, proposing the president uh, of the commission taking into account. Um, I think it's very important to harmonize the national electoral rules but the most important part of the topic is related to the introduction, in my view, of the transnational electoral lists. That is a way to uh, foster uh, the uh, uh, Spitzenkandidaten system to uh, make it better uh, and to create a better relationship with the people and the uh, public opinion around Europe not only the small bureaucracies of the European parties. The, the risk of the Spitzenkandidaten system is to be a very good system for uh, Brussels bureaucracy, Brussels political bureaucracies. We need to avoid this risk. We need to overcome it um, with the direct link with the public opinion. And I think the transnational electoral lists is the way to do so. I strongly support uh, this topic and I hope uh, we will have uh, good results on, on this. I add, when I uh, underline the problem of uh, democratic legitimacy, the fact that it's very important also in my view to solve the problem of the um, right of the uh, European Parliament to take initiative, to take legislative initiative. That is not the case today. And the fact that the European Parliament uh, is part of the legislative process without being part of the beginning of the legislative process is, in my view, one of the main problems of the uh, uh, European uh, uh, political uh, and governance architecture. And I think the Parliament is right when asking uh, for having this uh, uh, right. Uh, and it's uh, the other key issues. When when I I mentioned the, leg the democratic legitimacy as one of the topics of, of course, I, I want to be very clear. I'm not saying that European institutions are not legitimate today. They are completely legitimate. There's a formal legitimacy that is complete. I think we have to complete it uh, in a more substantial way, uh, in the way in which I try to mention some topics. I have to say, I would like also to add something more, something more in terms of narrative, but names are important, uh, as Umberto Eco always uh, said, nomina uh, sunt consequentia rerum, and uh, I think it's, uh, it's a crucial point. Uh, for instance, I think it's time, finally, to change the name of the commissioners and to name them uh, secretaries or ministers, but this name, Commissioner, Commissaire, Commissario. Uh, we know very well that in the large public opinion, it, it's a, it's a crazy way uh, to uh, uh, to to overlap uh, the how we say uh, the criminal investigation uh, narrative with uh, European political narrative. Commissario, Commissaire. Uh, commissario, uh, it's it's not a minister. It's uh, usually is Montalbano or Derrick or something like that. And in, this is the way in which public opinion uh, see. Uh, and and the same, I think, also for for the European Council. The European Council has to become uh, uh, the, uh, the, the 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 Senate of the European Union, uh, having uh clear that the role is not the role of the center of the system and it's part one part of the system so and the commission too the commission executive uh, la commission executiva it is clear that this term ex executive has to become part of the narrative i know that uh, we always think that these aspects are not so relevant in my view they are relevant. They are relevant in the relationship with the public opinion. So uh, second uh, term, I, I try to be a brief, a veto. Uh, I think we have to eliminate the veto, the veto culture within the European Union. We experienced during the last three years many, many bad uh, examples of this veto culture. The veto culture, in my view, is only 
uh, a blackmail culture. The blackmail uh, with the uh, role of uh, member states using the power they have in some few fields, mostly related to uh, foreign defense, uh, security policies, uh, using this veto they have uh, to, to blackmail on other subjects. Uh, I think we have to eliminate it. We have to eliminate the veto culture. I know it's difficult to say, and it's, it is difficult to, um, to, uh, to, to do. But my, my point is that I don't want to, uh, we say, only to, to express uh, uh, a wishful thinking. I'll try also to move uh, in a concrete direction. And I, for instance, I, I would prefer to have a collective, a collective veto rather than uh, uh, the present individual veto. Uh, countries want to keep the veto rights. Okay, we move from an individual veto to a uh, three collective video, veto. Uh, so you can only three countries together can veto a decision. Uh, for instance, moving uh, to this direction means that you can avoid the blackmail uh, uh, culture, uh, because at the end of the day, you have to be sweet to the point. Usually, the veto right is on the table because one country on one topic that is not so interesting for this country use the veto right they have to have an advantage on another field of national interest of this country, but not of general uh, interest. This is the problem of the veto right. So if we move from an individual veto to a three collective veto, so three countries together, uh, I think that would be a revolution. It is not just a detail. It's, uh, it's in my view, it's a great change. That could be a great change. It's a way also to say to the different countries, okay, we understand that national interests are there, but national interests, they have to be there uh, with an idea of a link with a, a general interest, not just uh, a national uh, interest uh, with the blackmail culture. My third point is, it was the term Brussels. Uh, Brussels is the European capital, Brussels is the center. I uh, am strongly against uh, Brusselization of Europe. I'm strongly, strongly against the idea that everything has to be put in Brussels. Everything has to be centralized in Brussels. All the decisions, all the meetings there, the European Parliament from Strasbourg to Brussels, all the decisions, all the uh, people working in the European uh, um, institutions in Brussels, uh, all the European councils in Brussels. I think it's a mistake. It's a big mistake. Uh, because Europe is not uh, like uh, Spain, uh, France, or Germany, or Italy, or, uh, or, or Northern I or, or, or Ireland, or, or Sweden, where you have a capital and all the political power is in the capital. The European Union has a federal uh, mood and the federal mood means that all the 27 national capitals are European capitals. And in my view, it is important to continue thinking that uh, the European uh, center is Brussels, but it is also the, the other 26 because Brussels is also a national capital. Uh, and, and the same for Strasbourg, Luxembourg, Frankfurt. Uh, I think um, this is a, a topic that I don't have time now, but I would like to develop it also in the relationship with regions and cities. The subsidiarity principle means also the fact that we have to consider the fact that one of the failures of Maastricht was the fact that in Maastricht, we invented the uh, committee of the regions. And, uh, and this idea was, in my view, a very good idea. And all the season and uh, eve 
of the structural funds with the protagonism of local powers and uh, territories, regions, cities, we have to, I think, uh, reconnect with this uh, uh, idea and, and we have to relaunch the role of uh, local authorities within the European Union. Local authorities are the best allies of the European identity uh, because we have always to consider that the strength of Europe is the fact that Europe is pluri-identity. There's a European level, there's a national level, there's a local level, and, uh, and we have to make all, the, all this level uh, living together. And uh, this is why it's so important to have regions and cities protagonists. And we have to, to think again and to reinvent the way in which they can be uh, protagonists again. Uh, and so uh, be cautious on having everything centralized in Brussels. I like very much Brussels and I want to protect Brussels from these risks. Uh, otherwise, Brussels risks to be considered by the city, by, by the citizens, uh, as maybe a large part of the American citizens think um, about Washington DC, so the, the temple of uh, all the bureaucracies, uh, uh, all, all the intrigues, and, and nothing more and nothing more interesting than that. And, and Brussels uh, not deserves this kind of destiny, in my view. My, second, my fourth and fifth uh, words are society and citizens. I'm very short because I'm, I'm uh, out of time. Um, society means that we need to put uh, social partners and organize civil society within the governance of the European Union more than we have today. Uh, and that was so crucial and so important during the pandemic. It will be more important also in the future when we will discuss about, for instance, the future of the single market and the main discussions about, for instance, all this very important topic that is the future of uh, the European sovereignty, the future of European sovereignty in terms of uh, having a national industry, uh, European industry uh, sovereignty, uh, having the possibility to uh, uh, become more independent uh, on energy, on security, uh, on technology. Uh, there's a big discussion in, in this very period after decades in which we, uh, the, the, the theory and the practice of the European Union was to be dependent uh, on energy, on security, on technology, because we were the center of the world and we were at the center of the world and working uh, he, he, we, without closed doors, the idea was to, to, to take the best from uh, any place in the world. Uh, now we are, to, we are moving towards a more, I would say, warrior period in which we need to be more independent. Uh, and I think we need uh, this uh, coordination with social partners uh, and organized civil society. We have to work. Uh, to uh, uh, have all these parts of the European society more involved in the European decisions. I have no time to develop it, and I have no time to develop my fifth point, that is the other one related to is, in my view, linked also to the success of the uh, citizens' engagement during the Conference on the Future of Europe. Uh, we have to say that this exercise, the, the exercise of the Conference on the Future of Europe, was a, it was a successful exercise in the part of the um, engagement of citizens. And uh, what is doing, what the European Union is doing in terms of, of participatory democracy, uh, it's a success. Uh, but we have to continue, we have to develop it, and we have to find a way to uh, uh, do it in, a, in continuity and uh, giving the European institutions and national governments the possibility to use this uh, new uh, toolbox of participatory democracy that worked very well during the Conference on the Future of Europe. I hope now that the, the results of the Conference on the Future of Europe uh, could be used 
uh, by uh, European institutions and during the European elections to find uh, the good solutions that are needed at the European level. But participatory democracy today has to be put at the very core of the discussion on the future of uh, European uh, governance. Uh, my uh, time is over, so I stop here. Uh, my proposals are uh, very poor proposals, but uh, I have to be, a, I'm very passionate in uh, trying to raise all these ideas because uh, the next 12 months will be months in which uh, we want uh, to raise a European democracy uh, and to put European democracy at the very uh, core. And we want to take lessons from the two, uh, three, four, five big crises we had in the past, because I'm sure that the next elections won't be elections in which the European Union uh, uh, death will be on the table uh, like it was uh, some elections ago. Uh, we will have elections in which uh, the discussion will be which kind of Europe we want. Uh, and so we have to be uh, very, very um, ambitious. And as Sebastian said, we have to think the unthinkable uh, because the way in which the world is going uh, brings us to uh, be very ambitious. Thank you. Thank you very much, Enrico. Thank you for this. This. Uh, this. Uh, you, you have presented us a world project to reshape Europe, from the, the way of organizing elections to the way of taking decisions to the way of engaging citizens, or even the way of uh, naming the institutions. So I think it's a, it's it's practically a program to go to the next elections. Uh, I I I know I will give the floor to our panel. I'm very glad to have a, a very rich panel with four people. I would say that. Uh, it's particularly nice because we have a perfect, uh, uh, I would say, gender balance and at the same time also geographical balance. We have people from, even if you, many of you are now in Italy, uh, we have people from, uh, from that have a very good knowledge of different parts of Europe because I think one of the things also that we have to ask ourselves is whether we all think the same about how to reform Europe. Uh, and it's, it's, it's one of the questions we want also to, to discuss today. Uh, do we know, I mean, we have, we want to revisit this question of whether crisis creates more Europe or give an opportunity to, to deepen, deepen the European project, but also we want to see whether, which are the problems, as, as Enrico say and as Sebastian say, which are the problems in terms of legitimacy and uh, engagement of citizens, but also if all, we all have the same vision of how to advance, how to move forward, how to make this Europe more resilient to crisis. So I don't speak anymore. Let me present you the four panelists. Uh, on my left, I have uh, Thierry Chopin. Uh, Thierry is a special advisor at the Jacques Delors Institute. He is also a visiting professor at the College of Europe and also professor at the Col de Mint of Paris. Uh, Thierry, you have worked a lot and you have plenty of, uh, of, of publications on EU institutions and uh, on, uh, on, on politics in Europe in general. You are recently working a lot on European values also. And, and, uh, and, and populist, euroscepticism, and uh, also you publish on on the EU governments in response to crisis uh, some years ago. I remember a paper on that. So you will have a lot of uh, a lot of ideas on that uh, to share with us. Then uh, we have also Federico Federico Fabrini. You are professor of uh, EU law in Dublin City University. You are founding director of uh, of the Brexit Institute, which is one of our partners uh, in the Regroup uh, project. And you were until now visiting a scholar at Princeton University, and you have just uh, explained us that you are now visiting at the UI in Florence. Uh, you, are, you have also extensively worked on EU law and policy and published a lot on that. And you have recently published a book on, uh, on EU legal capacity, legal integration after COVID-19 and the war in Ukraine uh, at the Oxford University Press, which is really, I mean, very much related with the topic uh, that we are discussing today. Then we have Lena kolarska Bobinska. Uh, Lena, you are a professor of sociology and you were also former member of the European Parliament from uh, 2009 to 2012. And then you uh, became a uh, minister of, uh, of uh, research on science and education in Poland uh, in 2013 until 2015. You have also worked quite a lot on public opinion in, uh, in Poland 
uh, on the, on uh, on the image. I remember a paper you had on the image of Poland and Poles in Europe, and on the process of entering into the European Union for Poland. So it's it's also very interesting to know from your side what is the vision from this part of Europe uh, on this topic. And then we have Brigitte, Brigitte Lafan. You are president of the European Policy Center and emeritus professor of political science at the European University Institute. And you were, uh, until very recently, also director of the Robert Schumann Center for Advanced, Advanced Studies in Florence. You have also extensively worked on EU governance and Europeanization. Um, uh, you have also worked on EU public finances. I remember very well your first uh, work on that. Uh, one of the you know the most uh, classics on EU public finances, and also recently also on Brexit. I think you have followed quite a lot the question of Brexit, which can be also labeled as a crisis for Europe. Um, and you also coordinated a book on Europe's Union in crisis just before COVID. So I don't know if you had uh, changed your vision on on the EU response to crisis after the publication of this book that was published in 2019, just before the the COVID crisis. So I will not. I will stop here, and I give the floor to Thierry for ten, uh, eight, ten minutes each of you, and then we will give the the floor to the to the public if you want to pose some questions. Thank you very much, Analia. Thank you very much for the organization uh, of this meeting, and I'm very happy and honored uh, to to attend this meeting uh, with Federico, uh, with Brigitte, and and, and Lena. Uh, eight minutes or ten mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, to uh, to cover um, a lot of uh, a lot of topics, uh, but uh, I will try to uh, uh, to say a couple of words um, and perhaps a couple of words about um, to to introduce uh, our, our topic. Um, uh, I think, uh, of course, we we had um, an experience of 15 years of, of crisis, but uh, I think we can say that. Actually, uh, we are in a period of uh, public crisis uh, to with the war in Ukraine, with inflation, with the energy crisis and, and so on. And perhaps it could be useful to, uh, to say a word ab about the concept of, uh, of crisis because uh, this word is uh, quite ambivalent uh, because it can refer not only to a violent shock, uh, that leads uh, to a crisis management in face of uh, um, very exceptional circumstances, um, but also a crisis situation uh, are linked to uh, periods of transition. Uh, uh, we remember, for example, Anna Arendt uh, in this book, in her book, uh, about the crisis of culture. And the subtitle of this book uh, in French is The Gap Between uh, Past and Future. Uh, and I think it's interesting to, to have in mind uh, this uh, definition of, uh, of the crisis um, like um, a period of transition between past and future and also corresponding to a crisis of authority. Um, and I, I think there is a very, very strong link uh, between the crisis and the question of authority, of government and of the capacity to, to respond to this kind of uh, exceptional circumstances. Um, Tommaso Padua uh, at the start uh, of the Eurozone crisis, wrote uh, in his uh, latest article, uh, I quote, uh, the gap between the needs of the demos and the way in which the Kratos acts is one of the greatest dangers to the survival of democracy. Um, and uh, in such a perspective, in such a, a context, um, I, I would like to, to make a few remarks um, in order to uh, first um, draw lessons uh, from this uh, 15 years uh, of, uh, of crisis management and second, in order to, to try uh, to define uh, conditions for fostering the development of a genuine uh, EU executive power. Um, about the, 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 first, uh, the first set of remarks, um, I think uh, that the, the first lesson uh, is linked with Jean Monnet's uh, very famous uh, assertion, Europe will be made in crisis and will be the sum uh, of the solutions adopted for those crises. And uh, I think we can say that over the past 15 years, um, at least three examples uh, seem to confirm uh, the argument of, uh, of Jean Monnet. And, 
my analysis on this point is very close to the analysis of uh, Enrico Letta. Uh, the, the first example um, is the fact that under the pressure of the economic and financial crisis um, in 2010-2015, uh, the Eurozone has been strengthened uh, by the, the creation of uh, several mechanisms in, in the field of financial solidarity, but also, of course, the ESM. Uh, and we can give a lot of examples uh, about such, uh, such uh, very, very important decisions. Uh, the second example, uh, which seems to me very, very important, is uh, the case of Brexit. But Federico uh, could have uh, more precise elements uh, about this, uh, uh, this crisis. Uh, the Brexit didn't lead to the disintegration uh, of uh, the European Union, and on the contrary, it announced the cohesion of the 27 member states, not only at the level of national government, uh, but also at the level of public opinion. And I think it's something very important to, to have in mind. And of course, the, the, the third example um, uh, is linked with the, the very strategic decisions uh, which uh, have been taken during the pandemic with next generation EU, of course, but also just uh, after the invasion, the Russian, the Russian invasion of Ukraine um, with exceptional decision um, not notably with the sanctions, but also uh, with the uh, political, economic, uh, military, and humanitarian uh, support to uh, to Ukrainians. So I think we we can say that uh, Jean Monnet's accession uh, seems justified, uh, even this even if this argument perhaps could not be applied to all the crises uh, we were confronted during uh, the last uh, 15 years. And I think uh, on this point, on the refugee crisis, uh, of course, which is a, a counterexample, uh, uh, which is very, very important. Uh, second lesson uh, of this, um, of this uh, 15 uh, years of crisis, um, the sec second lesson is about uh, the, the role um, played by the, the national governments uh, in the response uh, of, uh, to, to, to this crisis and, and about the, the role played by the, the European Council in the management crisis uh, at the European uh, level. Uh, I think we, we can uh, talk about an ambivalence uh, of the role played by the, the European Council, uh, ambivalence because um, crisis can have positive uh, uh, implications because, because of the exceptional uh, political implication at the highest uh, level um, in the member states, at the level of the head of states and, and government. So it's something which could be, uh, which could be considered uh, as positive. But at the same time, uh, I think we can say um, that the primacy of national governments um, in the, the, the management crisis um, could have also negative uh, consequences and, and implications. Um, the first one, for example, the difficulty for the EU to, to speak with a single voice. Um, second uh, element, the, the fact that the time involved uh, for diplomatic negotiation uh, can be slow. Uh, it depends uh, of crisis, uh, obviously, but uh, uh, it was the case, for example, during the, the, the Eurozone crisis, uh, obviously. And uh, I think uh, the, the, this fact uh, creates uh, an uncertainty uh, at the European level and could have uh, a cost, uh, an economic cost. Uh, we saw that during the, the, uh, the Eurozone crisis, but also a, a political cost. Um, at the same time, um, it's interesting to, to, to note uh, that um, during the, the last years, uh, during the pandemic and, and also uh, during the, the, the first months uh, and this first year of uh, Russian war in Ukraine, it's interesting to note that the EU seems to have learned uh, some lessons of previous uh, crises and has also made uh, progress in recent years in responding and in reacting uh, faster uh, to, uh, to, uh, to, to crisis. And the example, again, 
of uh, next generation EU uh, and uh, the example also uh, of the decision taken uh, by the head of state and government uh, after the, the, the invasion of Ukraine uh, are something uh, which could be uh, interesting to, to, to have in mind. The third lesson uh, it's uh, something not about efficiency of uh, the decision making process uh, under the pressure of the exceptional circumstances, but uh, it's the, the problem of legitimacy and uh, accountability. Um, I, I said that progress uh, has been made uh, in the way the European institutions have responded to crisis uh, in terms of uh, efficiency. But uh, at the same time, I, I think the, the question of legitimacy of this crisis management uh, uh, must also be raised um, for uh, different reason, reasons. Uh, the first one is the fact that uh, I think from a theoretical uh, point of view, uh, of course, efficiency is a component of legitimacy, but it's not sufficient uh, to, uh, to define what is legitimacy, which can't be reduced uh, to efficiency. Uh, and if we agree with uh, such uh, a definition of legitimacy, uh, we have to, to we can uh, focus on, on three elements. Uh, we, we can be problematical uh, from the, 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 the democratical perspective. The first one is the fact that over the, the last 15 years, the decisions uh, made in response to the crisis were uh, taken at the national and at the European levels in a state of emergency. And uh, I think, uh, of course, um, it's, uh, it's something normal that we have to, to take decision um, uh, sometimes without the, the control of the, the parliament because we have to, to, to be efficient and we have to, to react very quickly uh, in response to, to this crisis. But at the same time, the, the constraints and the necessity, the pressure of the events uh, are the significant cost, uh, not only from an, an economic point of view, for example, during the Eurozone crisis, but also from a political point of view, because uh, it reduces the scope uh, of political choice. Uh, so it's something which is very, very important uh, uh, in democracy. The second element is the fact that during period of crisis, uh, we have no real uh, opportunity for public and transparent uh, debates on very, very important uh, decisions to be taken uh, at European level to, uh, uh, to, uh, to solve uh, this, uh, this, uh, this crisis. Uh, and last element uh, on these lessons, last but not least, <laughs> crisis uh, show also the, the high level uh, of complexity of the European political system. And uh, I think this uh, high degree of complexity, of fragmentation of the European executive power uh, have very negative implication in terms of accountability because the, this high level of, um, uh, of uh, fragmentation and complexity could lead to a dilution uh, of accountability. Uh, it's very difficult from a civic point of view uh, from, for citizens uh, to, uh, to, to answer uh, this very uh, normally easy question. Uh, who is accountable at the European level uh, for the decisions taken in the face of crisis? Uh, it's not so easy to, uh, to answer this, uh, th this question. So I think uh, uh, to, um, to, to, to finish this first set of remarks, that European governance uh, in times uh, of crisis is characterized by uh, what we can call an imbalance uh, between national diplomacies uh, and, uh, on the other part, European uh, democracy. Uh, second set of, uh, of remarks, uh, what can we do? <laughs> it's, uh, of course, the most, uh, the most difficult question uh, about this, uh, this challenge. And I would like to, to focus on, on three elements. Uh, the first one, um, and uh, Sebastian uh, uh, said uh, in uh, the, his words of uh, introduction that we, we have to develop uh, foresight uh, capacity and I think it's something very, very important. Uh, the, the challenge of anticipation, of foresight, 
it's something very, very important because um, during the, 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 the last uh, past 15 years, uh, the EU has always uh, seemed to be one crisis uh, behind and uh, uh, we were always in a position of reaction uh, to, to this crisis. So strengthening Europe, Europe's crisis management, management uh, capabilities means uh, anticipating and preparing for, uh, for, for the future. I would like to, to give just one example of that uh, in, uh, in linked uh, with uh, very, very recent uh, events and tragical events, of course, in linked with uh, the, the, the war in Ukraine. Uh, for example, uh, if we consider that the European Union uh, wants to act more uh, with more efficiency uh, in order to, to defend uh, its uh, uh, security interests, of course, uh, the European Union needs to invest more in its defense uh, capacities. Uh, and what we can see uh, is that uh, the, the shock of Russia's uh, invasion of Ukraine was a wake-up call uh, on this point of view for Europeans. But at the same time, uh, Europe is running late uh, on such an, uh, uh, an issue. Uh, second element, um, uh, I, I think that um, in, in the short term, uh, we, we need for a political leadership uh, to embody the European common response to, uh, to, to crisis and solidarity uh, in context of uh, exceptional uh, circumstances. And uh, I think I would like to, to stress on just one example um, for the discussion. And I think the, the example of the Barnier method, method uh, could be something useful uh, on this point because uh, it uh, highlights the conditions for effective and legitimate governance in response to, uh, to, to crisis. Executive dele delegation for the Council, a mandate uh, defined by the Member States uh, on which the, the chief negotiator for the European Condition, Commission uh, could negotiate with uh, London uh, about the the, the economic relations uh, after after Brexit uh, and, and and so on. So I think this model um, could be very useful uh, in, if we, we try to uh, to imagine uh, something stronger uh, to to react to, uh, to to crisis. And the the last last proposal, uh, which is not very original, <laughs> um, and. Uh, which is very close to, to the proposal by Enrico uh, in his uh, presentation, is the fact that if we want uh, to respond to the um, executive and legitimacy deficit uh, of the uh, European Union, uh, I think we have to foster the development of a real uh, executive Europe and a European executive power. Uh, which is clear, uh, democratically accountable uh, to the European Parliament. And so perhaps two concrete proposals uh, in order to achieve uh, this, uh, uh, this goal. First, uh, consolidate, uh, I agree with the uh, the Spitzen candidate in the system to elect uh, the president of the commission. And uh, second proposal, Perhaps, and I, I, I know that there is a lot of there are a lot of uh, discussions about this uh, kind of proposal, but perhaps the, the opportunity, the possibility to, to merge uh, the, the posts of president of the Commission and president of European Council. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thierry. I, I, I mean, I was thinking about what you say about the definition of crisis. I remember being in a conference with uh, in which Vestager was saying maybe we are naming everything crisis and many of the things we name crisis are just challenges we have in face of us and he was asking for a better definition of crisis so it's an it's an idea to to think about federico the floor is yours thank you very much uh eulalia and to your colleagues uh, at the jacques delors institute in paris for uh, the invitation and i also want to thank Piero Tortora and uh, his colleagues in the uh, Horizon Europe uh, regroup uh, for involving Dublin City University and myself as work package leader uh, in this project. Um, I want to contribute to the discussion that was 
launched by uh, Enrico Letta and, and continued by uh, Thierry Chopin by uh, raising uh, only three points, uh, which are really based on my recent book, EU Fiscal Capacity, uh, Legal Integration After COVID-19 and the War in Ukraine, which I uh, recently published with Oxford uh, University Press, as Eulalia mentioned. And to keep myself uh, short, I'll... We don't hear you, Federico. You're mute. Can you hear me now? Did you hear me previously or not? No, no, yeah, yeah. It was just the last part of your last sentence. That oh, okay, were. great. Uh, yes, I was just saying to, in order to be as short as I can, I'm sharing the link to the book. So those of you who want to know more can uh, perhaps pick it up from there. But basically, uh, the three points I, I want to make are, are the following. Number one, I think the response uh, by uh, the European Union to the COVID-19 pandemic was uh, transformational, uh, mainly due to the establishment of the Next Generation uh, EU Recovery Fund. Uh, nevertheless, and that's my second point, uh, this transformation must be consolidated given the challenges uh, of the war in Ukraine, uh, which I think call for a permanent fiscal capacity in the European Union. And at the same time, and that's the th third point, uh, I think a number of uh, institutional and constitutional reforms are urgently needed uh, to back up these developments uh, and increase the effectiveness and legitimacy of the EU, as both Enrico and uh, Thierry have highlighted, particularly because uh, I think the prospect of enlargement uh, is uh, inevitable uh, for the European Union. So let me elaborate very quickly on, uh, on these three points. I'll start with Next Generation EU, which uh, in my view, uh, constitutes really a turning point for the process of European integration, because contrary to what had happened a decade ago during the Euro crisis, I think uh, Europe learned uh, from the prior crisis and reacted to the pandemic uh, in the right way uh, with a forceful response, uh, which deepened integration. Uh, in particular, the creation of the Next Generation EU Recovery Fund uh, is, uh, uh, is, I think, a game changer for uh, the European Union because first, the European Union gains borrowing power uh, to a massive scale, almost a trillion euro of common debt. Secondly, the EU now has really uh, fiscal resources uh, spending power that uh, has been leveraged in the, in the last two years and will be leveraged in the next uh, three more years to support uh, growth uh, in the European Union. And third, uh, last but definitely not least, uh, with Next Generation EU, there is also a commitment to introduce taxes uh, at European level to repay the debt uh, and the capital. So um, we can discuss whether it's a Hamiltonian moment or not. I would think it is, uh, uh, but definitely the, uh, the uh, response to the pandemic uh, did put the European Union um, in the direction of becoming a stronger, uh, more capable actor uh, in public finances uh, more, uh, more broadly. Now, the challenge is, and here's my, my second point, how to make sure that this transformation is not sort of, um, uh, sort of uh, exclusively uh, ad hoc, limited to dealing with the pandemic, but rather becomes uh, a more permanent change uh, for the European Union. We know that formally next generation EU is a temporary instrument, it was created exclusively to deal with the pandemic, even though in reality, uh, most of the funding uh, is actually devoted to uh, programs which are not pandemic related. They are really uh, connected with growth, cohesion, uh, industrial developments, the green and digital transition, and so on and so forth. Since the creation of Next Generation EU, of course, however, uh, the uh, war in Ukraine has exploded, and that has further deepened the need for the European Union to leverage resources, collect uh, funding uh, jointly, and uh, support uh, the Ukrainian government in its effort to uh, repel the Russian uh, illegal aggression. So what we've seen over the last few months is using the next generation EU legal technique to again raise uh, common debt, uh, have common new funding and transfer this funding to Ukraine. An example is the European Peace Facility. Another example is the macrofinancial uh, assistant instrument for, uh, for Ukraine. And of course, we have new proposals for common funding. Now, the challenge that I see with this uh, behavior is that it tends to be peaceful. Uh, it is connected to each and every new crisis, but there is no long term uh, thinking about the structural implication of a, of, of a federalization of uh, fiscal resources uh, in the European Union. And that takes me to the third point I, I want to uh, raise again uh, 
uh, here in my in my short remarks, which is really the question of institutional reforms. And uh, let me let me utter the uh, the words that nobody dares to say: treaty change. Uh, uh, there is, of course. Uh, uh, a repellent response by most people whenever the question of treaty change uh, is raised. Uh, this is true both in France, uh, which has a complicated history with it, as well as in Ireland, which also has a complicated history uh, with it. But uh, I do think ultimately uh, we cannot avoid uh, dealing with that. Certainly there is a lot that we can do within the current uh, treaty framework. The passerelle clause, for example, could be used to overcome uh, unanimity votes uh, in some areas on, on fiscal resources, on finances, or uh, common foreign and security policy. But for example, we don't have any mechanism uh, to uh, really enhance the role of the European Parliament uh, in a number of key policy areas, emergency decision-making without uh, without changing uh, the treaty. So in my opinion, what we should do in light of the conference on the future of, uh, of Europe uh, is really to embark more, uh, more, uh, more bravely in this path. A number of uh, influential political actors have supported this prospect, notably French President Emmanuel Macron and uh, when he was Prime Minister of Italy, uh, Mario Draghi. Uh, of course, there are strong resistances to that prospect, but definitely uh, the, uh, the um, uh, looming enlargement that I think will happen much more quickly than we can all expect uh, makes the case to accelerate uh, the question of treaty reforms uh, as soon as possible. Uh, the European Union has been uh, capable of responding to crisis, but all of you and all of us think uh, the responses to the last crisis have also been suboptimal, and that's because of its governance weaknesses. And enlarging the union, making it an organization of 30, uh, 35 or more member states uh, without changing governance structures uh, are going to make this uh, even more complicated. Uh, therefore, I really think uh, this question has to be high up uh, on, uh, on the agenda. And I think uh, those that care about the future of Europe uh, should insist that, as ever, deepening and widening uh, should go hand in hand. And I'll stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Federico. Uh, I'm now giving the floor to, to Lena. I don't know if Lena can connect because I think that we have some problems of connection with Lena. Lena, can you hear us? Can you talk? <laughs> we don't see you. Uh, you can maybe put uh, at least uh, the image, the screen on. Can you hear me? Yeah, we hear you. Good. Fine. But you we don't cannot see, you. see me, but it doesn't matter. OK, OK, let's <laughs> then uh, we, will, we, will, we will listen to you. I, I had solved it. I had several problems with connecting, but at least you can hear me. Um, we were, I prepared, I would say, my what I want to tell you about the crisis and their effect on European Union. And being recently in Brussels and speaking with some officials from the uh, responsible for the health policy, I realized how this crisis have changed European Union, I would say, in a very beneficiary way. Um, not only as we know the, the mechanism, new mechanism, new institutions has been created, but also the image of European Union in Europe has changed enormously because uh, suddenly uh, European Union started to be more responsible for a domain which is uh, crucial to people, the, the safety, the health, um, I, I would say that European Union stopped, started to lose its very bureaucratic, heavy image. It was something which um, could provide us medicines very quickly in a very um, reasonable way. So, and also um, for many, the, um, the fight with pandemia has shown how many institutions and how many solutions could be um, used. So, my, so to answer if the crises are uh, useful, helpful, 
for changes? I would say yes, but we will know that only if the next crisis would come. And this crisis came, this is the Ukrainian war, and we are in the middle of it. So um, we still don't know how this crisis will change European Union, how beneficiary will be for uh, Uni European Union. On the one hand, uh, people start to be a, a more aware about European values, about European solidarity, about how democracy is important. Um, but on the other, uh, we can see that the treatments, uh, the way we treat one uh, crisis will um, tell us soon um, if this crisis, European, the, the war crisis has not changed in another crisis, which I would say it's internal. We were speaking here about the reform of European Union, about majority voting, about basic changes, and um, which many see as a changes around Eurozone group. Some others see as a integration of Ukraine, yes, we can introduce some changes, but only on the basis, as uh, one of the speakers said, of the majority voting. There are some countries in Europe which say we definitely don't agree um, for majority voting. Um, we want to keep the previous way of, um, of vo voting. And the question is, to what extent this conflict will, um, instead of helping us solve the crisis, previous crisis, the Ukrainian crisis, how will stimulate another one? Uh, would it lead to more disruption? Would it, will we devote our attention all the time on uh, reforms, discussions, solving conflicts. So I would say we don't still know how the Ukrainian crisis will, um, which effects it will have. First on global divisions, second on creating new divisions inside of the European Union, East, West, third on a third conflict inside of um, European Union. Um, so I, uh, so this is first point which I want to make. Second, um, with solving previous crisis, uh, European Union became the Commission, the decision making became more centralized, more federalistic, which I think it is profitable for the efficiency in making some decisions quicker easier, but also it omitted some um, debates, uh, negotiations, which is perceived as a democratic and um, par parliamentary relations. So what we are now, we ended up with more efficient European Union, with quicker, more decision, um, decision with quicker decision making, but on the other hand, there are two groups which are opposing, I would say two main groups which are. We do not hear you, Lena. I think you have been mute. Um, Can you hear me? Yeah, no. Yeah. yeah. So, so there are two groups which I think will um, protest now and will be stronger and stronger opposing what's going on in the European Union, also with wing, also we think that it's more efficient. One is those who um, are afraid of federalism and the other are those who want more democracy. I would say two groups on di di different opposing um, places on the same axis, those who want stronger who are afraid of a stronger federal union, others which are want to return to European Union with 
decision making, with dialogue, with problem solving, etc., etc. And I think these are uh, some of the conflicts and crises which uh, we expect. Uh, to finish, I think what um, I was thinking what European Union lacks mainly. I spoke with a German official recently and um, he said, yes, we made a mistake in undervaluing Russia. And I asked him why. He said, oh, because people make mistakes. You see, Americans also made mistake in Iraq. And I started to think maybe European Union doesn't put enough attention to predictions. All the crises help our institutions, decision making, some communication on the day to day basis. They are working on new solutions, but what's crucial is the prevention. And he added at the end of our conversation, uh, you see, I think that the crisis doesn't help European Union because European Union didn't prevent this war which it could. I don't know, I, he was not very clear how the European Union could prevent the war, but he said the European Union is uh, uh, devoted to peace, to development, um, and had other uh, attributes which could help uh, predict and resolve and this coming uh, crisis. So maybe in the future, we didn't foresee pandemia, we didn't see a uh, Eurozone crisis coming in, we didn't, and we didn't pre see and predict the war in Ukraine coming. So maybe what we really need before we get into next crisis, the management of European Union crisis and reforms, maybe we should put more attention on working on experts and on scenarios and more um, predictability. Thank you very much. Sorry for the inconveniences. Thank you very much, Lena. We have we have heard you very well. Do not worry. So uh, I, I, I see two points. I will come back later on because I will now pass the floor to Bridget. But I think one point that links to the to Federico's uh, yeah. uh, intention, which is this question of institutional change or constitutional change. Federico, you say we really need this institutional change, uh, especially all the more because we are going to an enlargement. At the same time, Lena, uh, tell us uh, that this can also create fragmentation. This can also create internal conflict. Co co how to deal with this? How to convince all the people that we need this institutional change? That's one point we can come back later on. And the second one, I think it's very interesting also from Lena is this question of, we have talked a lot, uh, uh, Thierry, also about crisis management, but we have not talked so much about prevention. And, and resilience, and actually NGU is about resilience, it's about keeping, you know, creating a, a Europe more resilient to crisis. So, uh, how, how are, are we being too much focused on, you know, as, as Enrico Leta was saying, to dealing with the short-term crisis, how to how to make Europe resilient to to, to next crisis, and also how to how to deal with slow-moving crises like the climate crisis, which are not really, you know, sudden crises that we have to deal with quickly. And now, now I have I pass the, the floor to Bridget, and then we will come back to the questions and also with the questions of the of the audience. Bridget, the floor is yours. Good afternoon, and thank you very much for the invitation to join a, a fascinating discussion and conversation. And what I would like to do is look back, but also then look forward. So let me say from the beginning that I think that the EU has learned through crisis, crises, the poly, poly crisis. It is now a tougher, more resilient and more robust polity, much, much more robust than it was with the onset of the Eurozone crisis. And it has learned from the Eurozone crisis, but we shouldn't underestimate the damage that was done by the EU's failure to grapple with that crisis quickly. It took a very long time to bring the acute phase of the crisis under control at a very high political, economic and social cost to Europe. And the political resonances of that crisis, in my view, still frame politics in Europe. So I think if we want to 
if we want to say which crisis the EU handled least well in this 15-year period. It was, in my view, undoubtedly the Eurozone crisis. But even then, it eventually brought the acute crisis under control and it generated new policy instruments. And I would argue that what we see in the EU is post-Brexit, post-2016, a new EU in formation. And that new EU is being formed under the pressure of crises and events and under the pressure for the 27 and to exercise more collective power. And in order to, to explain what I mean by collective power, it has two dimensions. Firstly, it's power to the Talcan Parsons image of power, the power to get things done. So in other words, the power to respond to the demands to get stuff done because of crisis. But in order for the EU to get stuff done, the power to, it must be a power with. And I'm I, I really want to reinforce what, what Enrico Letta said about the, the, the power with is the power of the whole and the parts, the member states and the EU. That we shouldn't regard the EU as what happens in Brussels. It is the whole and the parts. Now, how has the EU exercised collective power through the last three crises? Because if we want to think about the future, we need to understand. And I would say Brexit was a hinge crisis for the EU. Why was it a hinge crisis? It was a hinge crisis because it was a direct attack both on the EU as a polity and the EU as a market. And we, because the EU handled Brexit effectively, we tend to forget just what dangers lurked in Brexit for the EU in the summer of 2016, uh, because it could have had the domino effect, the disintegrative effect, the divide and conquer strategy of London might have worked. It didn't. So we need to understand why that didn't happen. And it wasn't accidental. It was very deliberate. It happened because there was in the collective a determination that Brexit would be defined as a collective threat to the EU and the 27 had to to respond in a united way. In other words, this was a crisis that division was not, could not work. And, and what we saw was within one week, it was the Friday of the 17th to the European Council. Uh, I think the European Council was 28, 29 June, where there was a collective framing of what Brexit meant that lasted through the entire process. Not only that, but there was very significant informal institutional innovation in terms of the task force in the Commission, the task force in the Council, and the uh, Brexit group in the European Parliament. And Barnier was the magical glue, but it wasn't just Barnier. The, the so-called Barnier method was the fact that this collective worked, all the institutions worked, with a very clear purpose, that purpose was political, it was uh, institutional, and in terms of the negotiating processes and mandates, the absolute clarity of the EU right through this process. So, and Brexit wasn't necessarily an easy uh, crisis for the EU, but it turned out the EU could manage. And because of that, I think, firstly, the output legitimacy of the EU increased, but I would also argue the input legitimacy increased. We saw post the Eurozone crisis, suddenly benefits of European integration, membership, et cetera, et cetera, beginning to go up again. And that was because citizens understand membership. They understand something called a club. And if you're a member, that has certain consequences. Now, how did that feed into the pandemic. I would say this was a more difficult crisis, but the nascent institutions that were there, the Center for Disease Prevention and Control, the European Medicines Authority, DG Sante in the Commission, and the Health Council, the Health Council met incessantly in, in the early part of the pandemic, began to again have a collective response. 
And but there were two, in in a sense, uh, first leaders in this. Firstly, the ECB didn't wait. Unlike the Eurozone, it didn't wait. There was an immediate response by mid-March uh, in terms of the ECB and the Commission innovative with the shore, which in my view laid the ground then for the European Council with their very intensive engagement and ended up with the RRF. But it wasn't just the RRF, it was also the joint procurement of the procurement of vaccines, which gave particularly small states were the beneficiaries because they would have found it very difficult to, to deal with big pharma. So again, you had collective power being exercised uh, in a way that really responded to the demands both on the economic side uh, and on the health side, because this was the pandemic was a, a an extraordinary uh, an extraordinary uh, external threat, symmetrical threat to all of the member states. Now you could argue, and I and I think I would argue that in terms of common procurement of vaccines, that if the EU has to do it again, it will be better at it. It will have learned from uh, those that early engagement with the pharma industry. But again, it showed EU power in, in action in a very visible way. And it took slightly longer to get a collective framing, but it was achieved. It took no time at all in relation to the war in Ukraine. This was the very day of the invasion. There was, um, there was the first European Council, and then you had the policy toolkit in terms of sanctions, macroeconomic uh, support the peace all of that rolls out but Europe has to be with Ukraine for the long term this is not over uh, we will know more in autumn 2023 about the what where this war is going is it a frozen war is it what kind of war it is but Europe the EU has no choice but to continue its support for Ukraine in the next phase, because if an authoritarian state succeeds in an interstate war on the European continent, then in my view, that's very dramatic for the EU and very problematic for, for the EU. So the EU is tougher, more robust, more resilient, but I think we now face another step change because the challenges are more are, are, are much greater. And those challenges, I would say, relate firstly to the climate crisis. We saw uh, the acute climate events in Emilia Romagna recently, but we're going to see more of this. So the climate crisis, decarbonization. The, the second is how Europe stabilizes its neighborhood. And in Enlargement is only one part of that, because I think the neighbourhood to the south uh, is equally frail and fragile and needs state and Europe must for it for the future of Europe itself, it must. And then I think there's a set of issues around hard geopolitics, what kind of role the EU plays in the future, the balance between US, um, US China and where Europe finds agency in terms of its international role and capacity. And that's a whole, so there are baskets of work that are very, very, very big issues, very big questions, uh, and Europe is confronted with them and will have to uh, respond and not just res be responsible, but be responsive as well. Now, the future, uh, could Europe have, handled the pan say the war in ukraine better if it had taken russian uh russian uh military build ups more seriously and i think yes because but if in my view it was the failure in 14 with crimea because once putin in a way got away with crimea there was always a problem but also think of what it would have required for governments in Europe in terms of energy policy, in terms of decarbonization, in terms of cheap oil and gas from Russia. It's very difficult for democratic governments to put up the cost of living in the absence of war. So again, I think we need to also be realistic about how, govern how governments uh, govern. So where does, uh, I think in terms of predictions, 
of crises. Um, it's rather that to be resilient in, in the face of crisis, it requires adaptability and agil agility and a capacity to respond in in in, de in real time. So what, what's required to do that? And then in terms of the, the future of the EU itself, qua polity, I very much agree with everything that's being said on the need for more politics. I think transnational lists, again, will strengthen political groupings at the European level, very important. I favor the Spitzenkandidat process, but only if it's a serious process. And if if the European Parliament is serious about the Spitzenkandidaten, then it, the political groupings must have candidates that the European Council would eventually agree to. The failure of the Spitzenkandidaten in, in 19 was that Manfred Weber was never, ever, ever going to be president of the Commission. And in my view, the European Council was absolutely right in that. I have no, he had no executive, he had no executive experience. So if the European Parliament is serious about politics, it must, be, and the European Parliament groupings are serious about politics, then they must be serious. So I would say yes to the Spitzenkandidaten process next time round, but the European Parliament itself must le learn the lesson. And I also think, and this is for the legitimacy of the parliament, the parliament itself must become much, much tougher on the internal ethical controls within its own house. The European parliament has no God-given right to more power. If it's not a well-run institution that adheres internally to good norms, then in my view, it should not get more power. So again, I think we need to, the European Parliament has to face up to, to, much, uh, to much tougher scrutiny. The accountability is not just the European Council, it's right across the board. And then on treaty change. So I don't think the EU can enlarge without treaty change, but we're not sure about the enlargement timescale. And so the question is, when will, the, when will the opportunity structure exist for uh, an IGC? I would like to see a, a better attempt at using the passerelle clauses in Lisbon. They're there. Uh, and in other words, simple ratification before going for a, a big bang IGC. But I have no doubt that there will be a big bang IGC on what timescale I can't predict. Uh, but it is difficult for the governments to launch one. It, the, it, it either will happen in the next electoral cycle or in the cycle after. And a lot, in my view, depends on the contingencies of, of the war. Now, when it comes to, I'm going to end with, with Samuel Beckett. Uh, Samuel Beckett has a, had a, one, has a wonderful uh, short poem on failure. And he talks of try again, fail again, try again, fail again. But I love the ending because it says, try again, fail again, no matter, fail better. And I think we, as scholars of integration, we've got to acknowledge that we don't have, we, we don't have the political agency to remake a constitutional system, a policy system, a polity system, what we can offer are our perspectives, but in the end, it's the actors, those who have power. It is, they're the actors, they're the people who can actually change. Of course, I buy the, I, the importance of ideas and, the, and all of that. So we have a role, but we're not sitting, uh, you know, Enrique Letta is the only one among us who sat at that desk with the responsibility of power and with power comes enormous responsibility and governing our world today has become a very tough business. So I also think that it's, you know, we need to, as scholars, we need to acknowledge the agency of politicians and how difficult it is to govern uh, in the face of the kinds of challenges uh, that our countries and the, we collectively face today. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Brigitte. That's a very nice way of uh, of uh, closing this 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 uh, citation of Samuel Beckett. 
which makes me think about what, what you say about fail, failing better, actually. That's what, one, one thing that you haven't mentioned at all in all the speeches you and the rest of panelists is the, is the question of differentiation. We have worked a lot on differentiation. We've had a project on differentiation in the past. Uh, and my question to you and to all the panelists is, do we have as a scholar to promote and to work and to conceive and to put forward proposals on how to differentiate? Or differentiation has to be as a second or third best that we do not think about it and if it has to happen it happens like a kind of you know sort of force of pragmatism that, that's one question i want to pose you because we talk a lot i mean you all seem to agree that we need a treaty change but we all know that that's very very difficult and that in the end in the past has been very difficult always so uh, do we have to think on second best or it's something that we better not think about because if we think about and we prepare nice proposals maybe we are you know helping them to happen actually but before helping, uh, passing you the floor to, to answer this question or to react to the other panelists' uh, discourses, let me let me take some 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 of the of the questions of the floor of the public. Sorry, we have one one question here. I will read you uh, the question. The panelists have made the case that an increase in the EU output legitimacy, more efficiency, came at the cost of input legitimacy, citizen participation, particularly during times of crisis. Could you comment how you consider situations of crisis to impact the EU's throughout legitimacy defined as the quality of decision-making processes at EU level? What is your, your take on that? Maybe we can, we can uh, answer this question and then uh, I give you the, the possibility to, to react to the other panelists and then I will come back to other questions from the, from the audience. We can start from the beginning with Thierry. Uh, I give you the floor, Thierry. Um, yes, per, perhaps two, two, two elements. Uh, the first one about uh, legitimacy output, input legitimacy, mm -hmm. uh, and perhaps uh, a word about differentiation or, or in the second time. Uh, As you want, I mean, you're okay. free to. Um, you, can, you, can, you can briefly touch both things if you want. Okay. Um, so, uh, as I said, uh, uh, I think um, uh, efficiency, so output legitimacy, um, it, is not the only component. Uh, of political and democratic uh, le legitimacy. Uh, legitimacy is something which is linked with um, uh, the trust uh, of the citizens uh, in uh, institutions, uh, not only uh, in the, the, the response uh, of these institutions uh, to, uh, to the crisis, uh, but also, uh, I think um, we, we need for um, something like uh, public and transparent debates uh, uh, in order to, uh, to take good decisions. So, of course, I know that it's very, very difficult uh, during uh, and under the pressure of uh, exceptional circumstances uh, and the temptation of uh, the head of state and government uh, and also perhaps temptation of the European Commission uh, is uh, taking some uh, exceptional decisions uh, without any control of national parliaments. Of course, it depends on member states and um, uh, of the, the control of the European Parliament. But uh, I think it's something very, very important to, to, to link uh, citizens uh, to link uh, uh, the groups of civil society uh, to, to such very, very important and strategic decisions, uh, which are touching to very, very strong national consensus uh, in, the, in a context where this crisis are what we can call perhaps sovereign crisis on uh, competencies which are uh, at the core of uh, the sovereignty of the member states. Uh, it's a case uh, in, the, uh, uh, in the field of uh, fiscal uh, policy, in, it's the case in, in the field of energy policy, in the field of defense policy, and, and so on. We, we can uh, give a lot of examples about that. So uh, it seems to me very, very difficult uh, to, to take decisions without any public interest on debate on, on such issues. You want to say something no, on differentiation no, later? I will take time to... So Federico, to it's your turn. Point. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Olail. I actually want to address uh, really the question uh, about differentiated integration that uh, that you asked. 
um, uh, just a couple of minutes ago, because I think uh, uh, you're right. Actually, we nobody really made made uh, uttered the word differentiated integration, but of course, many of us have worked on it. And uh, I have myself uh, put forward a proposal that is based on differentiated integration to deal with the question of treaty change. Uh, a couple of years ago, when the um, Constitutional Affairs Committee of the European Parliament asked me to reflect on further avenues for possible integration in Europe. And uh, in that report that I commend to your uh, reading, uh, I basically suggested that we should embark on a process of treaty change, but because it's likely that there will be resistances to treaty change, we should learn uh, from the experience of the response to the Euro crisis is when uh, the member states decided to conclude a number of separate uh, agreements outside the treaty framework, no notably uh, the fiscal compact, but also the treaty establishing the European stability mechanism and the uh, treaty establishing the single resolution fund. And the interesting thing, at least from uh, the perspective of a EU lawyer like myself, is that these new treaties, uh, these uh, uh, separate treaties concluded about a decade ago, for the very first time in the history of European integration did not require unanimity to enter into force. And that's really the key point because we know that treaty change uh, on uh, according to article 48 of the Treaty on the European Union require the vote uh, and the approval of every single member state and therefore you know the French in a referendum or the Irish in a referendum can block uh, everyone else. The interesting institutional and legal innovation of the last decade during the euro crisis is that for the first time treaties were concluded which overcome that principle. So the fiscal compact only required actually uh, um, uh, a favorable vote by a majority of Eurozone country to enter into force. And the ESM had a special uh, rule with weighted votes for uh, for countries. But the bottom line was that nobody could, could block the others. And I think uh, and that's what I argued in my uh, uh, in my uh, report for the AFCO committee. Uh, that could be a plausible way out for the European Union uh, in the aftermath of the Conference on the Future of Europe, for example, uh, where there will certainly be resistance to change, and and therefore, uh, you know, proposing or putting on uh, on the table uh, an alternative treaty for those who want to move forward. Uh, could significantly uh, change uh, the ratification game uh, and therefore the interest for the holdouts uh, to uh, to join. Now, that proposal has not, uh, I mean, the AFCO committee endorsed it. Uh, it it's not, uh, however, something that it's being discussed. But in a way, I, I frankly see uh, the more recent establishment of the European political community as doing something very similar, but outside the EU and in a broader way, rather than inside the EU uh, and with a, a more limited membership. And uh, it's interesting that both the idea of the Conference of the Future of Europe and, of course, now the European political community are coming, uh, are the brainchild of uh, French President Emmanuel Macron, uh, who to me seems to be the only political leaders who really thinks about those questions of, of institutional change uh, at the moment. Um, and as, as enlargement discussions are going to intensify in the next few uh, months uh, and, uh, and years, I think those points will have to be taken up uh, and addressed uh, again. Thank you, Federico. Lena, you want to, to intervene? We don't see you, but... Yes, oh, okay. yes. can I say something? Sure. Yeah, um, I am just curious how you plan, because you, you are saying we need to change the treaties. We already tried to change the treaties. We tried to work on new constitution and some of our actions failed. I wonder how um, you can approach this the way that it will not harm European integration and not strengthen to it. Because I'm afraid that you, you integration of Ukraine, it's a very important and crucial solution to the Ukraine crisis or war crisis now. But I'm curious if this will not end to further crisis, as I mentioned before. So instead of saying only let's change the treaties, I think it's important to work on how to change the treaties in such a way that it will strengthen the European Union and not uh, make some uh, big harm to um, in integration. 
Thank you. Thank you, Lena. Brigitte, you want to say something on that? So for, firstly, on, on differentiated integration, I, I think we're at somewhat of a, a lull because Brexit removed the country with most opt-outs. We now, that was followed by Denmark withdrawing from its opt-outs. So in fact, there's less differentiated integration in the EU now than there was in the past. Secondly, the EU actually has a core. It's the Eurozone. It's a big core and it's an open core, but it is a core. Uh, thirdly, any differentiated integration that is not that is permanent in my view will never fly because no country no member state would agree to be in a second tier or in a concentric circle that's way outside that doesn't mean that one wouldn't see uh, other forms of differentiation in europe like epc but epc will remain in my view largely a talking shop it's not a serious proposition uh, on Frederico's argument about uh, the lack of veto on major constitutional change, I profoundly disagree. And I disagree because the EU is also constitutional. And in order for the legitimacy of the EU, and this is the formal legitimacy, not just the political leg legitimacy, all member states must agree to changes in their own constitutional framework. It's tough. It may make it very difficult, but in my view, you would actually, you can, I think we, you can as easily break the EU by being too radical on the constitutional front than by being not radical enough. So in other words, I, I, and I would also say that I do not see it politically happening. I think it's, it's interesting. It's a good discussion, should be part of a discussion, but in my view is not a good direction for, 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 the, uh, for the EU. Very quickly on input legitimacy. I don't want anything I said to be taken as that I think that uh, output legitimacy is enough in any political system, it's not. But again, in order to strengthen the input legitimacy of a very large and complex polity like the EU, you need to have national discussions led by national actors, transnational discussions in, in all sorts of different form, formulas, be it civil society participatory, but also representative. So in other words, it has to be, it has to be a way that goes with the grain of politics in Europe, because otherwise uh, we can come up with all the bright ideas, but they won't actually fly, uh, fly politically. But I do think that there is a stronger European public space today than there was 10 years ago. Thank you, Bridget. The, the problem is when there are citizens that don't want to participate in this European space, what do we do with the part of the citizens that really don't want to engage themselves in this political, European political uh, debate? That, that's, that's one question. But I, I just, uh, we are running out of time. Ah, okay, Federico, just... Uh, no, if I if I can, Eulali, because I think both uh, both uh, Lena and and Bridget uh, uh, called me in on on this question of of treaty change. So I, I just wanted to quickly react uh, on that. And I, on the one hand, I fully see where they are coming from and, and the point they are making. But at the same time, I would still urge them uh, to sort of consider the other side. And uh, in this respect, as I said, uh, both legally and politically. Uh, we uh, the the question might be actually might, might much more open ended. Uh, as as I mentioned, uh, the tool of walking around Article Forty Eight was used three times in the last ten years, and that's significant. And it was done to do important things like the the ESM, uh, for example. Uh, and historically, if we think about it, that's exactly how the U.S. Constitution was done, uh, which is a, a point we should never forget. The oldest constitution on earth was actually done by using a procedure which was in, in breach of what the Articles of Confederation uh, originally required. As some of you will know, when the United States became an independent nation, uh, uh, 
uh, after the War of Independence, it was governed by a first constitution, the Articles of Confederation, which are very much similar to the EU treaties today. There was no presidency. Uh, all rules were subject to unanimity, no taxing power at the center. And crucially, the articles could only be changed by the agreement of the 13 states of the United States. And of course, that created veto points, paralysis, and so on. And so uh, a few framers met in Philadelphia and drafted what we now know as the Constitution of the United States, and they inserted a clause uh, which said this Constitution will become the law of the land if nine states out of 13 ratified. Of course, if you look at it from a formally legal point of view, you're breaking the formal Constitution of the Articles of Confederation. But of course, every constitutional moment is a breach of the prior constitutional framework. That's something as a constitutional lawyer I need to emphasize. And you know, you know sometimes those breaches are necessary to move beyond uh, beyond the status quo. And that is also, I think, my my response to uh, to Lena. Uh, you're absolutely right. There will be strong resistances, and that's why I make the case for a grand bargain. Uh, the uh, enlargement to Ukraine, the Western Balkans, uh, and other nations is going to be uh, is going to happen very quickly. I actually think maybe Washington is going to call us and said, "We want the war for you. Now you take care of the rest and do it by Christmas." Uh, and you know, when that happened, we need to be ready to say, "Okay, uh, this has to be done within a broader framework." It is at this time of transformations that I think the window of opportunity for uh, for treaty changes. Uh, occurs. And, you know, I'm not suggesting this is going to be easy, but I think part of our job uh, is uh, is to sort of raise this point. And I will only um, share in the chat the report uh, I uh, was asked to write by the European Parliament if anybody is interested in it. Thank you, Federico. So we end with a, with a, with a point of, of disagreement. Actually, I don't know, Kerry, what do you think about the possibility of creating new treaties? Uh, <laughs> Breaching the last one. Um, so, ah, Brigitte wants also I'm to. So about, sorry. No, no, go ahead, okay. and then uh, I will pass um, to Brigitte. Uh, on the opportunity of the treaty change, um, personally, I think it it would be necessary, but unfortunately, uh, um, I fear that there is no political will uh, to uh, to move uh, forward uh, this uh, this opportunity. Uh, about the differentiation. Um, I think historically uh, it was a path uh, to, to integration and uh, I think with the, the, the fact that enlargement uh, uh, became recently uh, at the top of the political uh, agenda uh, at the European level, um, say something about the, uh, again, uh, the, the necessity to use uh, this kind of, uh, of path to, uh, to, to, to integration. Uh, notably because um, in the in the areas uh, which concern uh, the sovereignty of member states uh, i think in such areas it could be very very difficult to uh, uh, to bring together all the 27 and in the future uh, 30 member states uh, so uh, i think uh, we, we we could use again uh, differentiation uh, of course, with uh, uh, a lot of conditions, uh, we uh, we have to uh, to be clear uh, on the fact that the goal is not to uh, to create uh, a, a group of uh, second class member states and, and countries. Of course, right. and we we have also to be very clear uh, on the, the conditions for joining uh, the pioneer group, uh, which take the, the, the risk to, uh, to move forward uh, in defense and energy uh, and, and, and so on, and uh, to, um, to, to, to make the proof that uh, uh, this kind of way uh, to, to the integration is, is always something useful. Yeah, I, I, I must say I tend to agree with Thierry in that we we might not see differentiation within the 27 that we are now at the in the Union, but it is possible that the question of creating new temporary differentiation for the newcomers uh, is put on the table once we will start seriously on the enlargement. But I pass the, the floor to, to Brigitte for the last word, if it's if I agree with No, you. I, I, I just, I don't want to be pedantic, but I don't think that we can look at what happened in Philadelphia in the 18th century and think we can read across to 21st century European politics. This is mass politics. There was no mass politics in the US back then. It was, in other words, 
if Philadelphia was required today to have the American Constitution, it wouldn't work. <laughs> okay. I don't know if Lena has something to say about Philadelphia and the US Constitution. Otherwise, I think it's time to, to end the seminar because we are running out of time. I want to thank you, all of you, and also Enrico Leta, who I'm not sure if he's still there. We, he is there. Uh, for this this very very fruitful discussion, I think we haven't resolved the problem, but we we have at least see that there are points of agreement and disagreement, and and, and at least I think you agree on what are the points uh, at discussion. So that's something to start to start with, and uh, and uh, and I just want to thank also all the people who has followed the webinar, um, and just uh, say to you good afternoon and uh, see you see you the ones that we are sharing the regroup progress. Uh, project see you in the next event or next uh, seminar we are preparing bye thank you thank you very much take care